The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. signal for the signal oil program, the Whistler. I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular program on the West Coast. Remember, let every traffic signal remind you. With new signal gasoline, you do go farther than ever. Look for the familiar big yellow and black circle sign that identifies those popular signal service stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. The Cistern. There was murder on Ronnie Hartfield's mind long before he discovered the cistern in Round Valley. But the discovery more than anything else made him decide to do it. The groundwork had been laid, of course. He was a partner with old Hank Murphy in the gold-bearing ledge Hank had discovered on the shoulder of Sharp's Peak. A million dollars in rich ore. And Ronnie owned ten percent of it. That wasn't bad for a young metallurgist fresh out of college. But Ronnie wasn't the kind to think of his own 10%. No, his mind was on the other 90. And the inheritance clause in the partnership agreement. There had to be other things, of course, like the casual conversation he had one afternoon with Sheriff Dawson as they sat on the porch of the sheriff's office looking across the lake. But that ain't what makes the law enforcement out here so much tougher than in the city. What's the first job in a murder case, for example? Find the body. Body? Yeah. Hmm, look at that lake. Look at that, Ronnie. What? The sun on that water. <laughs> if I could move that lake to the coast, I could sell it for a million dollars. <laughs> Come around sometime during a rainstorm and I'll close the deal for ten cents. Mm, why? Well, she ain't a natural lake, you know. Well, we've had to move this shack twice now when the water was right up the floor level. She ain't always as pretty as she looks now, blue and calm and shiny. I don't know. I think it's worth it. Yeah, you'll be a mountaineer yet, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was I saying a while back? You were talking about law enforcement. Oh, yeah. It was this business of bodies. You can say all you want to about city police, but let me tell you they ain't in it with a county sheriff when it comes to a murder case. No. You see... Before you do anything else, you gotta find the body. You gotta prove the guy's dead. No. That's one thing in the city, but it's something else in a place like this. No, what do you mean? Or down in Arizona, for instance, where a man's got 20,000 square miles of country to hide the body in. I see. Funny thing, though, how bodies have a way of turning up. That guy in Arizona I was telling you about. Yeah? Eight years it took us, knowing all the time he'd done it. You found it, huh? Yeah. The wind uncovered it in a dry gulch ten miles from town. Dry air has a way of preserving things. You could identify it? Sure, we hung him. But if it hadn't been for that wind... Well, it would have been something else. Sometimes it don't pay to go looking for it. If you just lean back and relax, it'll work itself out. Sometimes. Well, Ronnie, it's odd that the sheriff should have hit upon the subject of bodies. And it's a good thing he couldn't read your mind, because everything he said made you think of the cistern in Round Valley, with the bare traces of a ruined cabin more than a hundred years old nearby. You'd been exhausted the day you found it, after following a four-point buck down the length of the ridge above and losing him there in the willows. 
Then, as you fought your way through the brush, your foot suddenly rang hollowly on the cover of the cistern. And there it was, deep and dark, completely lost in the tangled mass of trees. No desert wind there, was there, Ronnie? Once you dropped Hank into the cistern, he'd be there for keeps. Ronnie. Ronnie. Huh? Oh, <laughs> sorry, Hank. You know what, Hank? I think Ronnie's in love. <laughs> well, what's the matter? <laughs> well, i just been talking to you for five minutes, that's all. Oh, I was thinking, I guess. Mm, just like you, Hank. Comes into my store to buy groceries and goes to sleep by the stove. <laughs> he, he's thinking about that hole in the ground. <laughs> what? What's the matter? Marge knows all about it, mine. Oh, yeah. You picked yourself a pretty good partner, Ronnie, if that ledge is as good as Hank says it is. Even Stephen. I got myself a good metallurgist, too. What with a stamping mill to be built and all. Uh, th this ain't no pick and shovel project, you know. Gonna take money. Oh, don't worry about that. We, we got that all settled, ain't we, Ronnie? Soon as Mr. Coulter sees the plans Ronnie made up. Who's Mr. Coulter? Oh, fella down the city, old friend of mine. I'm going down below to see him next week. Alone? Yeah. Ronnie thinks he'd better stay around and look after things. Uh-huh. What's the matter? Don't know about Hank alone in the city with all them saloons. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go on, Marge. Well, last time Hank went down for a weekend, nobody saw hiding a hair for six months. If we didn't know him better, we would have thought he was dead. <laughs> oh, my. Better keep a close tab on him, Ronnie. <laughs> You're right. I'd better. You're pretty close to the brink, aren't you, Ronnie? The cistern was in your mind then, too. And it keeps returning more and more frequently until it excludes almost everything else. Particularly at night, when there's no sound but the crickets outside. And you can lie awake and think of the ledge. A million dollars or more in gold ore, almost on the surface. A tenth of it yours, according to the agreement. Unless, of course, something should happen to Hank. It would be all yours then, wouldn't it, Ronnie? A million dollars. And that kind of thinking always leads to the cistern and the willow thicket at Round Valley. There's no possible way they could ever discover it, is there? Finally, on the night before Hank is scheduled to leave, you make up your mind. Hank! Yeah? I just ran on to something. Uh, what, what? I want you to come with me. Well, what are you talking about? I've been up to Round Valley all day. Well, what were you doing up in that godforsaken place? I got a new outcrop, Hank. I'm sure of it. What? In Round Valley? Why, there's no gold. But there is. The... You've got to see it before you go down to the city. Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. This ain't a joke, is I it? I tell you, there's gold up there. I'm serious. Look, it'll only take us about two hours. Tonight? Why, it's dark already. Listen, will you believe me? This can't wait. Okay, Ronnie, let's go. up, Ronnie. I, I can't see where I'm going. It's not much farther. Why didn't we come up the other ridge? I don't see no sense in cutting across this infernal willow thicket. Wait up, will you? Over this way. Where are you? Can't you see the light? No. Went out of something. Ouch. Oh, these darn trees. I can't see a thing, Ronnie. Oh, doggone it. Where's the light, Ronnie? I can't keep my feet in this brush. Ronnie. Where are you? Ronnie! Ronnie! Here I am, Hank. Oh, you... <laughs> you scared me. Here's I'm the gonna... light, Hank. Huh? Thanks, I... Oh! oh! Now, the cistern... With the prologue of tonight's story, The Cistern, Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. There's an old Hindu fable about the blind men and the elephant. Being unable to see an elephant, these blind men decided to feel one to determine what an elephant is like. Well, the first blind man, happening to grasp the elephant's ear, promptly exclaimed, Why, an elephant is like a large leaf. But the second blind man, wrapping his arms around one of the elephant's huge legs, protested, Oh, no, an elephant is like a tree trunk. 
And the third man, feeling the elephant's tail, shouted, You're both wrong. An elephant is like a rope. Well, all three were right, but only partly right. And I'm always reminded of this story when I hear a motorist say, Signal gasoline is outstanding for quicker starting. Or another say, Signal is tops for faster pickup. Or a third say, New signal has higher anti-knock. Now, all three are right, but only partly right. For in new signal, you get all three advantages, quicker starting, faster pickup, and higher anti-knock. But in addition, there's a bonus, a bonus of extra mileage. For because of the amazing power in signal's new super fuel that helps you get this greater efficiency, this extra performance from your motor, you actually go farther than ever with new signal gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. Ronnie, it took a combination of things to put the murder of Hank Murphy in your mind. The ledge on Sharp's Peak and a million dollars in raw gold. The sheriff with his idle discussion on the importance of finding the corpus delecti. Marge's contribution about your partner's habit of disappearing for months at a stretch. But most of all, it was the cistern in the willows of Round Valley. The hiding place a thousand men could hunt for without ever coming close. That was the most important thing, wasn't it, Ronnie? And it's the thing that makes you feel absolutely secure now, on the morning after you kill him, as you walk into Marge's general store. Morning, Ronnie. Hello, Marge. Uh, now, wait a minute. If you're going to ask me how I am, the answer is awful. <laughs> What's the matter? Uh, coffee, no coffee. Forgot to pick it up last night. Yeah, I missed you. Missed me? Mostly Hank. He's picked up his groceries on Tuesdays and Fridays for as long as I've been here. <laughs> well, what'll it be, a pound? Yeah, that'll do fine. Funny thing about Hank, he's an old galoot in lots of ways, but part of him is regular as clockwork. <laughs> his drinking arm for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and getting his grub for another. <laughs> Last night when he didn't show up, I says to myself, there's something wrong somewhere. Uh, you say you ain't had breakfast yet? Uh, no, no. <laughs> Hank's probably cussing you out for fear, waiting for his coffee at this hour. <laughs> Drunk or sober, he gets his breakfast at 7 o'clock. What do you mean? Ain't he waiting up in the cabin? No, he's gone. Huh? Yeah, he left for town this morning. Why, he wouldn't do that. Huh, what? Go off like that without... Tell me, what time did he leave? I don't know. When I woke up, he was gone. Well, that's a funny one. He swore on a stack of Bibles he'd take a package down to my niece in Sacramento. Oh, he had a few drinks. Probably forgot. Well, where'd he get the liquor? Why, I suppose he had it in the house. He didn't have a drop in the house. He told me yesterday when he came in here and tried to buy some. We were out, too. As far as I know, there wasn't a drop in town and none come until Monday. Oh. Say, how'd he get out of town? Uh, oh, the six o'clock bus, I guess. You know, I can't help feeling there's something fishy somewhere. Huh? Why? Well, there wasn't no six o'clock bus this morning. It's still at Kramer's bar with a broken axle. Say. What? You don't suppose old Hank sprouted himself a pair of wings, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> you can't beat that old varmint. <laughs> I told you keeping a tab on him was no sin. <laughs> Funny, though, ain't it? What? About that package for my niece. Hank never done a thing like that, long as I can remember. Forgetting that away. You know, that's not like Hank at all. Well, Ronnie, you're not whistling now as you cross the street to the bank. You keep telling yourself that Marge is an old busybody, that the rest of the town will chuckle over Hank's unceremonious departure. There's a forced self-assurance about you as you walk up to Mr. Jenkins at the teller's window. Hello, Mr. Jenkins. Hi, Ronnie. What can I do for you this morning? Ah, uh, how about $20? Okay. All right. There you are. 
10, 15, and 5 is 20. Say, what about Hank? Huh? Ain't he supposed to leave today? Oh, he left this morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's funny. What's the matter? What do you use for money? Why, he had the money. No, he didn't. He came in here yesterday afternoon after three and told me he didn't have a dime. Wanted me to open up so he could draw $200 for the trip. Well, what do you know about that? He didn't pick it up either. Pick it up? I got it from just for closing and left it at the express office. Hmm, now, ain't that something? You couldn't have gone down without money. Maybe, maybe that's why he borrowed a hundred from me. Hmm? <laughs> That's why I came in this morning. He took all I had. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Ronnie. Are you kidding me? No, why? Hank never borrowed a dime in his life. It's kind of a religion with him. Oh, I... I suppose since I'm his partner, uh -huh, he... not Hank. Well, he didn't have much choice leaving this morning. I told him the money would be waiting at the express office. Hmm. Ain't that one for the book. Never heard tell of Hank Barron. Just not like him, that's all. <laughs> You're beginning to thank your lucky stars for the sister, aren't you, Ronnie? During the next few days, the town's curiosity about Hank doesn't die down. It changes first into wonderment, then into genuine worry. There's a feeling in the air that something is wrong. It hangs over the town like a cloud. And as the days go by, you begin to notice the conversation suddenly hushed as you approach. The penetrating, curious glances. The feeling of terrible doubt. Then, just a week after Hank's disappearance, you come home to the cabin to find the sheriff waiting for you. Oh, Hello, Ronnie. Oh, hello, Sheriff. What do you want? Just dropped by to say hello. Getting a mite worried about Hank. Yeah, so am I. Are you? What do you mean? Nothing. Curious, ain't it, how a man can get out of town without transportation or money? He had money. Maybe. And maybe he could have got liquored up without liquor, too. I don't know where he got that. Kind of jumpy, ain't you? Well, I'm getting sick of this talk, all, all this insinuation behind my back. Nobody's insinuating, Ronnie. We're just a mite worried, that's I all. I tell you, he's probably in San Francisco right now. That's just it, he ain't. Just picked up this wire from the telegraph office. Take a look. Huh? Been expecting Murphy for a week. Where is he, Coulter? Whoa, he's probably in some bar down there. No. What do you mean? He used to disappear for months at a time. You just don't know Hank. If there's money mixed up in it anywhere, there ain't a sober man in the county. You're crazy. Hank was a drunk and you know it. Was? Uh, I mean, he is. Hmm. Ain't it funny that you and I were talking about murder cases just the other day? Uh, now, listen, here I am. Better see who it is. Hank Murphy live here? Yeah. Well, they told me down at the hotel that the sheriff was up here. What do you want? Send him in, Ronnie. Come on in. You the sheriff? Yeah, what is it? Well, I just happened to say something down at the hotel tonight, and they told me you might be interested. I was driving through here the other morning on my way to Sacramento. What morning? Friday. Okay. I picked up a guy on the road about 6 o'clock. What did he look like? Did he have just on a... Just a minute, Ronnie. Tell us what he looked like, son. Oh, I'd say about 55. Kind of bald up here with gray hair and a mustache. I think he was kind of drunk. Said the bus wasn't running. You have a suitcase? Yeah, yeah. And I think he was wearing a black suit. I see. Six o'clock last Friday morning, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I took him down the road a ways. Let him off at the Sacramento Highway. Satisfied, Sheriff? Might be. Like I was telling you, Ronnie, sometimes it don't pay to get all worked up over these things. They have a way of solving themselves, sometimes. Well, I better be getting home. Looks like we're in for a storm. You have a lot of time to think during the next few days, haven't you, Ronnie? with the storm pounding around your ears, forcing you to keep close to the cabin. The nervous feeling inside is almost gone now, thanks to that boy who just happened to pick up an old hitchhiker at the right moment. That was a lucky break, wasn't it? 
Most of the townspeople are satisfied now that Hank is off somewhere on another spree. And you finally feel it's time to call again on Mr. Jenkins at the bank. As a matter of fact, Mr. Jenkins, I'm beginning to wonder about Hank. It's been more than a week now. Yeah, it is funny. Him hitchhiking out of town that way. Listen to that. Bet we've had ten inches of rain in this storm. Lake level's up twelve feet. <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me if the sheriff had to move his office again. And now, let's see, you wanted to look over the agreement between you and Hank. Yes, you see, there's a lot to be done before winter sets in. We ought to settle that business with Mr. Calder, get our materials up to the mm-hmm. site. And you're wondering if you can go ahead. Yeah. Mm. Looks as if Hank's in the driver's seat. As long as he's alive, anyway. Of course, in case of his death, you'll take a I didn't mean that. All, all I meant was we're losing a lot of sure. time. Sure. I know you didn't mean that. Well, I uh, guess you got to wait till Hank shows up, Ronnie. And put this away now. Getting kind of tired of looking at it. Sheriff was just in an hour ago asking the same question. What? Yeah. He wanted to know about the 10% and the 90% and who got what when who died. He got no right to stick his nose in my business. Funny about the sheriff. Seems to think this is his business now. Maybe you better go see him. That's a good idea. Well, Ronnie, kind of wet for you to be running around, ain't it? That doesn't, doesn't seem to bother you, does it, Sheriff? That lake's beginning to bother me, I'll tell you. Look at her down there, 20 feet away. That's not what I'm talking about. Well, sit down in the porch here and tell me what's eating you. Let's go inside. Nothing doing. I want to keep an eye on that lake. Now, what's the matter? When are you going to admit you're wrong? About Hank? Yes. Well, I'll likely admit I'm wrong on the day that Hank walks up to this porch like he used to and says, Howdy, Sheriff. Have a cigar. Trouble is, that ain't never going to happen. So I reckon I ain't never going to admit I'm wrong. Does that answer your question? He left town. Didn't that kid satisfy you? No. Could have been someone else. Who? Don't know. Too bad no one had a picture, Hank. Don't you see what you're doing with your stupid guessing? They all think I killed him. Well? Well, what? They're right, ain't they? They're wrong, I tell you. He was gone when I woke... Now, wait a minute, Ronnie. Hank was nothing more than a hunk of clockwork. He never went off his schedule. You just didn't know him well enough. That's why I know you killed him, Ronnie. I know why, and I think I know how. But just like I told you, when it comes to finding a body, a county sheriff has a job on his hands. And, of course, we can't do nothing till we find the body. I tell you, you've got no right to talk... Take it easy, sir. Now, wait a minute. If you're trying to bluff me, it won't work. I ain't bluffing, Ronnie. You see, all the time you and Hank were supposed to be inside your house having a few drinks before he took off, the house was empty, wasn't it? Because you happened to be off somewhere killing him at the time. I happen to know, because I dropped by at 10 o'clock to deliver Marge's package. Don't worry, though. I can't do nothing until I find the body, and like I told you, that takes time. Oh, no. Eight years that time in Arizona, but we got him the day after that windstorm. County sheriffs just got to have patience, you know. What's the matter, Ronnie? Nothing. Nothing. You're white as a sheep. What you looking at? It's, it's nothing, I tell you. Oh, you sick? I, I, it's all right. Oh, it's all wrong. Something's haywire somewhere. I... What are you staring at? Good Lord. Do, Why, it's... Do you, do you see it, too? In the water. The edge of the lake. It's... It's Hank's body. No, it's not. It can't be. Come on, let's take a look. No, no, I can't be I done. said come on. Well, Ronnie? It is Hank. Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, with reconversion occupying the spotlight today, here are some facts I think you'll be interested in. 
You know, of course, the vital role that independent businessmen played in the building of America. And you know that today, more and more men are expressing a desire to get into business for themselves. But did you know that my sponsor, Signal Oil Company, has for over 14 years sold its products only through independent businessmen? Substantial, responsible men who are so earnest about their business of serving the motoring public that they're willing to invest their own money in it. Naturally, signal dealers are carefully chosen for their ability and integrity, which explains why the average dealer has been with Signal Oil Company over seven years. So you see, there's a good reason why you find more conscientious, experienced men operating signal stations, and why signal dealers, with an incentive to build their own business, naturally give your car more thorough service that does help it go farther. And now, back to the whistler. It's too much, isn't it, Ronnie? Too much after the tension of the past week to look down at Hank's body floating at the edge of the lake right under the rail of the sheriff's porch. Everything breaks loose at once. You're jabbering like an idiot, telling the sheriff it's impossible. Oh, don't lie to me. You found him, didn't you? You found him and brought him here. It was a plot, wasn't it? Wait a minute, Ronnie. Well, why did you have to drag it out? You knew it all the time. You just wanted to talk to shut me. Shut up. Listen, I, I don't have... Shut up. That's better. Now, what in thunder are you talking about? Somebody brought him here. I put him in the cistern. Cistern? In Round Valley in the Willows. Cistern in Round Valley? There ain't no such yes, thing. Yes, there is. In the Willows thicket that runs along the bottom. Wait a minute. Did it have a square wooden cover on it? Yeah. Huh. What's that mean? Looks like you sent Hank back to us. Special delivery, Ronnie. What? It was dry, of course, until this rainstorm. Uh, it was dry when you put him in it, wasn't it? Yeah. You see, it ain't a cistern, Ronnie. It's an underground water flume. A what? A water flume. Carries the water underground from the upper lake to this one. When she overflowed up above... The water just picked up Hank and delivered him right to my door. <laughs> like I said, Ronnie, sometimes it just don't pay a county sheriff to get all excited and go running over the hills. It pays to just lean back and wait. Sometimes. Next Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood Signal dealer. This program produced by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. This is Marvin Miller speaking, reminding you to look for those familiar yellow and black circle signs that identify those popular Signal Oil stations in seven western states from Canada to Mexico. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.